book of Genesis in the beginning. You know, if you don't understand the beginning, you're not going to be able to understand the end. Our Father's work, word is complete within itself. It is full of advice, guidance, and telling us how to be happy in these flesh bodies, how to be successful in them when you follow his instructions, when you have the faith to know he's in charge. We have uh, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord and two other angels that have approached Abraham. And they kind of let him know, we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, hey, I've got 10 folks there. If, if you could find 50, and then he takes that on down to 30, as we left off in the last lecture, 30 being the blood of Christ, if you can find 30 righteous people, will you not destroy it? And he said, I'll, I'll agree to that. I, I, I will not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if I can find only 30 righteous people. And as Sodom and Gomorrah was, do you think for a moment he could have found 30 there with what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah? The answer is, of course he couldn't have. I, I suppose our father knew that coming out the gate. So let's pick it up there, if we may, with um, chapter 18, verse 31. Let's continue with this uh, discussion between the angel of the Lord, which is the presence of Almighty God, and Abraham. Verse 31, with that word of wisdom from her father, and it reads, And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure, there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. What does twenty signify? Redemption. If I can find twenty there, I won't destroy it. Verse 32, And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. He's pushing his luck here. Let the Lord be not angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And ten, of course, is testimony, law, and responsibility. You think he's going to find ten that answer to the testimony of the Lord Jesus, of Almighty God? And, uh, and of um, law and responsibility in Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 33, And the Lord went his way. As soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned into his place. Abraham had done what a kinsman redeemer is going to do. His nephew's over there, his nephew's wife, four daughters, and some sons, probably. Two of the daughters married, two not. Two were still virgins. And uh, naturally, he, he loved his kinfolk. He, he had taken 318 of his own family when, when uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was raided by some kings and freed his own relatives there and brought them back. And that's when, when Melchizedek met him on the way and Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. So here, here we have the two angels and the angel of the Lord moving toward Sodom and Gomorrah. Now God has already heard the cries of the wounded. He knows what's going on there. Chapter 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. And Lot sat in the gate, of Sodom, he was a judge there. Can you imagine that? He had worked himself up to where he was a judge. And Lot, see, that's what uh, sitting at the gate is. That's the gate of judgment. Uh, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. In other words, he recognized them as, as the presence of God, of angelic beings. And... and um, so as he sit in that judgment seat, he immediately we see that Lot's righteous. He's trying to protect these people, or will, verse 2. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, unto your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now, that, this was a dangerous place, just as many of our cities today. 
would be a dangerous place to abide in the street all night. Think about it. Think about it. And you might realize sometimes how close we come to being Sodom and Gomorrah in certain places today. Verse 3 to continue. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him. I mean, he knew what was the danger. And entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. And he took real good care of them and protected them. Now, when, when someone is under your roof, you are totally responsible. That was the law of the land, even in Sodom and Gomorrah. You were responsible for their protection, for their safety. For And before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, even, I mean, even the children were involved in this. All the people from every quarter, uh, even the children were corrupt in this place. And God had heard those cries. You don't, you don't put anything over on our father. Verse 5, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And, and uh, naturally, uh, Lot being responsible, I mean, he is, he's a judge in this community. He's very wealthy. Probably this is the reason he even took the judgeship, so he could take care of all of his cattle and have grazing rights and everything else in the Fertile Valley. And thought ahead. But... Um, uh, as we go, verse 6, And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. He pulled it shut behind him, protecting these two, seven, as if they needed any protection. Verse 7, And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. There's, there's no reason for this. Verse 8, Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. They're virgins. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. They came here, I brought them in for protection. It's very difficult for me to understand how this could be. And I suppose it's the way of the land and how little women are thought of in, in the Middle East at many times. But uh, thank God here we would have had a shotgun leaning against the wall and we would have protected our women folk. We were trained to do that from childhood up. And so it is even to this day. So it's very difficult for, for a free-thinking person living in a free nation such as this great nation, America, to understand how even Lot, being a righteous man, could come to a conclusion like that, to throw his two daughters out there to a pack of perverts. Uh, maybe knowing they're perverts, he knew the women didn't have too much to worry about. Verse 9. And they said, stand back. You know, probably more like, stand back. And they said again, this one fella come in to sojourn, he traveled among us, and he will needs be a judge. Now, will we be a worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. I mean, they were going to take those two men. And, and uh, what happens then? Verse 10, God's in charge. He is even to this day. Verse 10, but the men put forth their hand, these, these two angels, and pull Lot into the house to them and shut the door. Now something divine happened while that door was open and while they reached out to touch Lot. It was so bright, you know what happened, 11? And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. 
I mean, that bright light that's from those angels glaring into the wickedness, the evilness of the faces, even from the children all the way on up, blinded them. Verse 12, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Question. Son-in-law, or thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. They couldn't even find ten. So they're going to blow it. They're going to destroy this place. These people, you don't have to worry about them being blinded. They're not going to live that long. They're just about to be incinerated. Verse 13. For we will, this is absolute, we will destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. We're here for one mission, one mission only. We couldn't find the ten going up in smoke. You want to live, you better get out. Verse 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his son-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get ye out of this place. For the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his son-in-laws. I didn't going to happen. You don't have to worry. We're just having a ball here. We enjoy living here in this place with all these loose morals and everything. Don't, don't shake us up or try to shake us up. We're happy right here where we are. They won't be long. They're mocking him when he's trying to save their lives. Fifteen. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. You're going to burn with it if you don't get out of here. Verse 16. And while he lingered, he hesitated with all this. The men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of the two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. I mean, literally carried them out of the city. 17, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Now, Lot has turned himself into a city boy, living here along with his plenty of water and plenty of uh, city life and everything you could get right on the corner at the little quick trip. And up on that mountain, he wasn't trained for that. Now, personally, myself, I prefer the mountain. Lot didn't want to go to the mountain, in 18. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. And he liked to live dangerously. 19. Behold, now thy servant has found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy. I can tell you're having mercy on us, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and I die. I'm not equipped anymore to handle that kind of thing. Not as Abraham would be, or not as anybody that faced the country life. Nothing out there to bother him like would bother him in that city. Verse 20. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? Can't. Can I just go there and find solace? You know, uh, we can see salvation within this. He said, you've saved my soul. And we, we know what Christ went through to bring salvation to everyone today. Sometimes it isn't appreciated, I think, as much as it should be. But nevertheless, a price is always paid for it. 21. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, and I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. In other words, the little city you want, 
but I could add something to this, yet. I'm going to do it, but not yet. Verse 22, hasty, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Zoar means little one, okay? But do you know what it, um, do you know what it was called before it was called Zoar? It was called Bela. And Bela means destruction. So it still lies under the surface exactly what's going to happen there. You'll remember we covered this back in the 14th chapter, I believe in the 8th verse, somewhere along there. Verse 23, the name of the city, that is. 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Now, they have been very patient in moving him and his daughters and his wife, and away they go. You probably need to know geographically where Zoar is. It's right at the base of the bottom, I'll say, south end would be the bottom of a map on the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea. Salty there. Verse 24. And then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And so it was, he cooked it good. The remains of this place have been found. Father doesn't tolerate perversion. Verse 25. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city and that which grew upon the ground. And I'm sure Lot's getting a pretty good picture of this as she's going up in, in smoke. 26. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Now, now people have trouble with that, but... I mean, she was struck dead. She was told, they were told, don't you look back, don't desire what you left, because that's what it amounts to. She was beginning as they moved toward the mountain and get out of that little old city that, that um, she was going into uncharted territory, been a little soft in the big place, and it was burning. And she glanced back and boom, the father took her. She disobeyed. And, and they're being gracious enough as it is on behalf of Lot, not necessarily, but Abraham. Because Abraham had interceded. You, you think an intercessory prayer isn't powerful? You think intercessory prayer for a, a, a relative, a kinsman, doesn't work? Well, then always think of this case where God would go to this extent to pick up Lot and his family through intercession of who? Abraham. So um, intercessor, intercessory prayer is always a powerful, powerful thing. It touches the heart strings of Almighty God. You can always count on it. So, um, but anyway, back to the fact that she was turned to salt. A lot of... Anything that stands still on the south end of the Salton Sea is salt encrusted. Boom. Just like that. I mean, it takes a little time, but it, it, it's encased in salt. It's just a thing of nature, so don't make any big thing out of it. It happens. And uh, so she became. Verse 27. And Abraham, we leave them now, and Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. 28, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. When God does it up, he does it up good. 29, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. Again, intercessory prayer. Don't you ever, ever underestimate the power of intercessory prayer. For someone that is righteous before Almighty God, as Abraham was, with faith that would withstand whatever. And... Um, 
So, and so it is. Uh, verse 30, And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. It didn't take him long. When he saw the fire smoke and the brimstone, he said to the girls, Let's get it on the road. Let's do what God instructed us to, off to the mountain. And his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And so it is. As far as they're concerned, I mean, the whole world was destroyed around them. They saw it. It went up in smoke. 31. And the firstborn said unto the younger, these two daughters, Our father is old, and there's not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. In other words, we're the only living beings. A lot of people think that this was an incestuous affair, and that's what drove it. It's not. Okay. Just get that out of your mind. There, this is the law of survival placed in every human being by Almighty God. That they think they're the only people left on earth, and the only way they can ever go on is if they do what they have planned. 32. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father, that we can continue the bloodline on. 33. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn, the older daughter, went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. I mean, he was inebriated, let's face it. He was not aware of what went on. Verse 34. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. Now, they didn't know that Abraham is off where, um, where God had protected him and the rest of the family. They felt this was it. This was their only hope of even continuing life on earth as far as people go. 35, And they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not. When she lay down, nor when she arose, he was not the least bit aware of it, was not aware. 36, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And so it was. And verse 37, and the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. Moab means of his father. That's what the word in the Hebrew means, of his father. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. A people were born from this, a nation. 38, and the younger. She also bare a son and called his name Benami. The son, the same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Now, in the Hebrew tongue, Ben, Ben is son. Ami is people. And, and what it is, it's son of my people, is what it means. But then, uh, and, she, and so he was called Ammon, which is the people. And so it is that um, they, they did what they felt was survival for mankind, thinking with the destruction. I'm sure it was an awesome, awesome sight to see the wrath of God come down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And when, you know, God's wrath, he's got seven vials of it that are in store for very soon. Yeah, and I feel it will happen in and to this generation because this is a generation of the fig tree. Well, what is the generation of the fig tree? It is the generation that would live when Israel would become a nation again after being gone 2,000 years. And so it was in the year of our Lord, 1948. And we are told in Mark 13 that all prophecies would come to pass 
in the generation in which that would happen of the fig tree. So, uh, so how awesome it is that our Father gives us a sample of his own emotions, his feelings, and the completeness even into that that is absolute. There's no ifs, no ands, no maybes of his judgment as it will come down when the vials begin being distributed upon the peoples of this world. They're coming. You can count on it. This is an example. And there's no reason not to be righteous. What does that mean? Well, it means to do what's right. That's, that's all, to be natural, to be as God created us, and to fulfill that that he would have us fulfill, to be successful in serving him. With his blessings, that's not a great task, because with God's blessings, anyone can survive. Anyone can, can um, be pleasing to Almighty God. And, and so it is. Uh, and we have here then, as we continue, uh, Abraham, as he moves on, seems like Abraham and Sarah, they kind of, they, they were half brother and sister, okay? They had different mothers, but they had the same father. But they would use this among certain nations because Sarah was a beautiful woman. So, so very desir desirable, and and this oftentimes caused problems. Uh, but God always protects the woman through which the Christ child would come, so that 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 lineage would be pure and and suitable all the way from the family of Noah, who was a perfect generation, meaning pedigree had not intermixed with the hybrids or the fallen angels and was fit to bring forth the Christ child. So here we move into that quarry again, chapter 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and um, he dwelled between Kadesh, that's holy, and Shur, the wall, and sojourned in Gira, uh, this, a lodging place there. Two, and Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, that's the father of the king is what that means, Abimelech, king of Gira, sent and took Sarah. I mean, that's, uh, again, you can see she was a beautiful woman. Verse 3, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And this is restoring her to where she belongs and protecting the woman through which the Christ child would come. To the extent that our father would go to see that this is accomplished is awesome. Verse 4. And that would shake old Abimelech up, okay, verse 4. And Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous man? I haven't touched her. Verse 5. Said he not unto me, that's Abraham, she is my sister. And she, even she herself, said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. Verse 6, And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. In other words, God interceded to protect the woman through which the Christ child would come. That's his way. And this word to touch her is naga. 
Hebraica, in the Hebrew tongue. Seven. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife. You do it. For he is a prophet. Got that? Abraham, he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou, that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. In other words, I'm going to snuff out the whole bunch of you. And he's getting pretty good at this after Sodom and Gomorrah. There's no step for him. Okay? And uh, he's going to protect the prophet, the prophet's wife, and the longevity and the promise of the Savior to come, which would be the Savior of the world. That's why this is so important. Many might not might think this, well, it's just two people. No, it was the lineage to bring forth the Savior of the world. Where you, we, it would be almost impossible for us to attain eternal life without this having happened. That's how important it is. And that's why God goes to these extents to protect that lineage through which the Christ child would come. Verse 8, Therefore Abimelech arose early in the morning, and he called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Now, Abimelech told him, he said, if we don't do this right, he's going to wipe out the whole bunch of us. Because you're mine and everything I have, he's going to snuff out. We're nothing but dead men if we don't do as the Father stated. And again, our Father always protecting, not, not, only, not only Sarah and Abraham, but even protecting you today who believe upon that Savior that came forth through this lineage. That's how important it is, and that's why you don't want to miss the next lecture.